Good morning, and welcome to this March 13, 2022, Second Sunday in Lent, MediaCast of the Heinz Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, located at 408 North Madison Street, Albany, Georgia, 31701, where the pastor is the Reverend Dr. Or L. Spragan, Jr., the presiding elder is the Reverend Dr. Bobby K. Galladay, Sr., and the presiding prelate is Bishop Thomas L. Brown, Sr. Today we will have various members of our family to share with us concerning the season of Lent and concerning Women's History Month. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will be blessed by today's service, that you will accept the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, and that the Spirit of the Lord will prevail in your life. Sunday in Lent. We're using this period preceding Easter as a time of remembering, repenting, and rejoicing. Today let us think for a moment about the meaning of the symbol of the crowing rooster. First let us look at the scriptures, Mark 14, 27 through 31. For when the time came that Jesus was betrayed 
arrested and brought before Caiaphas, where do we find Peter? The scripture says again in Mark 14, 66 through 72. No, no, I swear I do not know that man. Three times, this is what Peter loudly said. The suffering Christ turned and looked at him, and Peter, weeping, bowed his head. The cock's crowing rang in his ear, piercing his heart like a spear. Today, Christ is looking at you and me. Will we deny him and turn away? Christ is my Savior and loving Lord. These are the joyful words we can say. We do not need the cock crowing clear to remind us that Jesus Christ is here. Let us pray. O oh God, our Savior, as we seek to bring others into your kingdom, we pray that our actions and words will not be a denial that we are serving you. In Christ's name, amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, thou hast been our help throughout generations, and we are grateful for your mercy and your love towards us, even your great mercies and your great love. We thank you for forgiving us of our sins, even now as we repent of our sins and we acknowledge that we are sinners in need of your grace and forgiveness. We are in need of the life that only you can give. You give us life, you sustain life in this world, and you offer to us and give us life in the hereafter. We thank you, God, for, again, your mercy towards us in this way. We remember that not only did Adam and Eve sin in the garden and thus became the beginners of sin and the entrance of sin into this world, but, Lord, we also recognize that we too have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And so, God, again, we ask that you would forgive us and help us by your Spirit within us, dwelling within us, to be better and to do better according to your word and your will, and certainly, Lord, according to your power. Yours indeed is the power. Yours indeed is the kingdom. Yours indeed is the glory forever and ever. And while we look around us, O oh God, each and every day and see those who deny your power and your kingdom and your leadership and your ability in their lives, O oh God, and so as they create chaos and trouble and turmoil and strife and war in this world, as we look around us and see all these things, O oh God, we say, have mercy upon us. We look around us, O oh God, and we see that you are indeed a merciful God. We look around us and we see that while in some places COVID is still continuing and raging and even increasing, we also see, Lord, that there are places where it is decreasing. We thank you, O oh God, for your mercy. We do see death around us, O oh God, and we do see sickness, but in the midst of death and sickness, we also see life and healing, and we say thank you. And even in death and even in sickness, we know that you are merciful, that you provide comfort, that you share your love, and you give us persons, God, that we can depend on and who help us from day to day. And so, God, again, we say thank you for your love and for your mercy. We thank you, O oh God, for your church and for those who have come before us, that, Lord, we might know you as God, that we might know your way, that we might study your word, that we might be comforted, and even that we might meditate on you, O oh Lord, with song, even spiritual songs in our hearts and in fellowship with one another. We thank you for the church and for those who have come before us. And we ask, O oh God, that you would help us to be the church that you would have us to be for this day in in this time that those who are coming after us may know you as well God help us to leave a legacy help us Lord to leave an inheritance for our children not just oh God physical things of this world but God help us to leave them the church and help us God to leave them faith and help us God to leave them strength in you help us God to leave them a knowledge of you not just head knowledge but heart knowledge oh God we ask oh Lord that you would 
Lord, help us to do this because we know that in you is life everlasting and we want them to have it too. Oh, bless your name, oh God. We ask that you would bless all of those who are assembled under the sound of my weak voice, oh yes, God, today. We ask, oh Lord, that you would bless them. You know what they stand in need of. And so, Lord, we pray that according to your will and your mercy that you would grant it, even according to the desires of their hearts, according to your will, oh God. Bless your name this day. Whatever we offer to you, and yes, Lord, thank you for having something to offer to you. And we pray, God, that you would help us to give it up to you. Help us, O oh God, to give you our songs, our prayers. Help us, O oh God, to give you our offerings and our praise. And whatever we do, Lord, may be pleasing in your sight. For you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Have your way in our lives and have your way in this worship service. Again, God, we just say thank you for being God, for being who you are and helping us to know you. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Why do we celebrate Women's History Month? Women's History Month is a dedicated month to reflect on the overlooked contributions of women in the United States history, from Abigail Adams to Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth to Rosa Parks. The timeline of Women's History Milestone stretches back to the founding of the United States. The actual celebration of Women's History Month grew out of a week-long celebration of women, contributions to cultures, history, and society organized by the school districts of Sonoma, California. In 1978, presentations was given at dozens of schools. Hundreds of students participated in a real women essay. Contest and a parade was held in Santa Rosa. A few years later, the idea had caught on within communities, school districts, and organizations across the country. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter issued the first presidential proclamation declaring the week of March 8th as National Women History Week. The U.S. Congress followed suit the next year, passing a resolution establishing a national celebration six years later. The National Women History Project successfully petitioned Congress to expand the event to the entire month of March. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Mrs. Rosia Hunter, wife of Bishop Kenneth W. Carter of the 11th Episcopal District. I am Dr. Doris Y. Williamson, wife of Bishop Henry L. Williamson, Sr. of the 1st Episcopal District. I am Ms. Wendy Jones Reddick, wife of Senior Bishop Lawrence L. Reddick, Bishop of the 8th Episcopal District. I am Mrs. Dolores Woody Walker, wife of Bishop James Walker of the 7th Episcopal District and the patron bishop of the Missionary Council. The Old Testament scripture reading for today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, and verses 17 and 18. Genesis, chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, 17, and 18. And today's readings come from the King James Version. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee up, that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And it came to pass 
that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The New Testament scripture comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17, through chapter 4, verse 1. Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17, through chapter 4, verse 1. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. May the Lord bless the reading, hearing, and doing of his holy word.
Today's message is based in Genesis chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, from the King James Version, and is titled, Nurturing Faith in Times of Doubt. Nurturing Faith in Times of Doubt. Those verses from Genesis chapter 15 read, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Let us pray. God, as we have come now to the preaching of your word, we thank you for what you have already done how you have already spoken, how you have already moved on our hearts and in our minds. We pray that you will continue to do so and help us to hear you and receive you this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Nurturing Faith in Times of Doubt As Christians, we have often talked about faith and preached and taught on faith and even encouraged others to have faith. But sometimes those lessons need to be relearned and those encouragements need to be heard again. Sometimes the going gets tough and the road gets rough, as the song says, and the hills get hard to climb, and, and the decision to make Jesus your choice seems more like a distant memory than a present reality. In such times of doubt and weariness, in times of spiritual illness, how can one's faith be nurtured back into good health? I believe we can all learn some things from today's scriptures. In Genesis chapter 15, we see the man Abram, whom God had called to leave his homeland and his closest family members to walk with God to an unknown destination. Abram had followed God somewhat blindly, but always obediently, which is to say he didn't know exactly where he was going, but he always knew that God was leading, and he followed God obediently. Sometimes he slipped in complete trust. And you can tell that as, as we read Abraham, Abram's story along the way as he travels, and some of the things that happens as he goes along the way, some of the things that happen as he deals with people, and as he deals with his wife, Sarai. Abram followed, sometimes slipping in complete trust, but always repenting and returning in faith. Now God has promised Abram an inheritance and a legacy, and even he, he told him that when he was starting out, before he started out, he said, come and let, I will take you to a place. And so now God is saying to Abram, he's reminding him of that promise that he made to him of an inheritance and a legacy. Abram is going to inherit much property as a gift from God, and he is going to have innumerable offspring who will inherit from him after he is dead. But at the time, Abram didn't have any children of his own. His name wasn't Abraham. It was Abram at the time. God, God had not yet changed his name, and he didn't have any children. And according to his understanding, he had not yet taken possession of the land of promise. There was someone in his household who could inherit from him, but... As we read in verse 2, Abram did not want to give his substance to someone who was not his child, though that person grew up in his house. It reminds me of those who have been enslaved or who are enslaved and, and who develop the property and build up the wealth but are denied any credit, any benefit, and any inheritance in the wealth they have produced. Abram felt he was going to be cheated by God nonetheless. He failed to remember the opening word of God contained in verse 1. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Not I will be, not I used to be or have been, but I am. 
in verses 4 through 6, in the face of Abram's doubt, instead of scolding his disbelief, God nurtured his faith. God made him a promise. And because Abram believed this promise of God, this reiteration of the promise, without proof and without evidence, God counted it to him for righteousness. This is faith. Well-placed faith. Because God who promised is able. But it seems not to have been enough. Not enough for Abram. For soon after we see him again questioning God's faithfulness. How do I know God? How shall I know that I'll inherit what you said? How will I know? What's the sign? What's the proof? What's the indication? God reminded Abram of God's promise to him. But now Abram doubted and asked for a sign, for some sense of assurance, something he could latch on to. Why did he ask now? Well, we don't know exactly why Abram kept going down this road. We don't know why some of us keep going down this road. But, but, but we do know that it gave him a restless night filled with nightmares. Was this doubt the, the cause of his horror? It seems so, according to the scripture. His present doubt destroyed his inner peace. What have you asked of God? Do you believe God is able? Has God had to remind you of his promises to you? Has he had to do it over and over? Have you since believed the word of the Lord to you? Or are you still walking in disbelief? How is it affecting your waking hours and, and your times of sleep or when you're supposed to be asleep? When you refuse or fail to put your confidence in God, you have torn the very thread that is keeping you in a place of security. In verses 17 and 18 of Genesis chapter 15, we see that God met Abram at the place of his doubt with the surety of a legal covenant. Some of us, we want to get it in writing. For some of us, we, we want to try to try to hang on, hang, hang the promise on to something tangible. And so God gave Abram some sense of tangibility, a legal covenant according to the custom of the day. What was his by faith was now also his by law. But it was God's law unto himself. And it was not enforceable by any human being. God made a covenant with Abram, but Abram couldn't enforce it. What's he going to do against God? God gives you his written word, but perchance God didn't do it. What could you do against God? God is faithful, though. God did not have to do this to prove himself to Abram, but he did do it to build Abram's faith. For the same God who had promised is the one who also now made the covenant and who put the seal on it. If you can't trust God to do the first thing, how is it that you can trust God to do the second thing or any subsequent thing? God will meet you where you are, but the requirement is still the same. You must have faith in God. The psalmist in 27 said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In verse 5 he says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. They are around me, but... I'm lifted up above them. I, I don't see them. I'm not looking at them. My head is lifted up above them. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. When I can't depend on anybody else, when the, the closest to me are, are, are become 
undependable. I can depend on God. I had fainted, verse 13, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Verse 14 ends, wait, I say, on the Lord. Those first six verses show us the satisfaction, satisfaction of a peace that is found in trusting in God and in worship. Abram desired tangible, temporal things. The psalmist desired intangible, everlasting things. To seek the Lord in times of peace is to know his keeping power and protection in times of war. If you know him when you are at peace, you can know you know the Lord in times of war, when things are not going well. Learn the Lord when all is well with you. And when things are not well, you will know him and he will know you. Those first six verses also express the promise and desire for a new and goodly land, a goodly abode, a goodly dwelling place, a, a, a good place, a fine place. Yes. The psalmist says, I know you, Lord, and, and I know what you can do, and I know what I want from you. And in verses 7 through 14, he expresses a, a future state or perhaps even a present distress. But here is what should happen when one has faith, whether it is a future hope or a present distress. When one has faith, according to the psalmist, belief ought give one strength to live and to go on with expectation. That's what he says he's going to do. Going to go on and go in expectation. This present walk of faith even in the presence of trouble, is also what Paul encouraged the Philippians to do in Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. When we look at these verses, when we see the conversation and, and the instructions and the encouragement that Paul is giving to the Philippians, what we see is that faith shows itself in a certain walk and a certain talk. Faith can be seen by what a person longs for, talks about, and values. You want to see what a person believes? You want to see their faith? Look at their life. Look at their, listen to their conversation. See their values. Perceive their core. Paul lifts himself and his companions up before the people as examples of a living faith in a faithful and living God. We don't look for fulfillment in the pleasures of this life when we have faith in God. Rather, we look for and we expect the joy that is ours yet to come. Yes, there are some joys, some pleasures that we have in this life, but that's not where we put our stock. There is a change coming that the things of this world will not endure and cannot endure. And if you are a person of the world, you cannot and will not endure the change that is coming. The glories of this world are, are for this world only. Reverend Dr. James Cleveland said it right. Lord, help me to hold out until my change has come. Because there's a whole lot that will tempt you to, to place your hope and your strength and your faith in something else. Satan comes against you with all kinds of things. We need God to help us to hold out. Those who seek the glories, the comforts, and praises that this world can offer are enemies, Paul says, of the cross of Christ. Why? He denied himself the true comforts and glory of heaven above, as well as the offerings of this world, as we looked last week at the temptations of Satan and Christ saying to him every time, I don't want that. Christ denied himself the heavenly glories and the earthly pleasures in order that he might be the savior of us all as promised by the Father and bring us into a heavenly canaan of eternal life. Yes, there was a promise to Abram of an earthly canaan. But there's a heavenly Canaan to come. The earthly canaan will pass away, but the heavenly canaan is forever and it is yours by faith in Christ. 
According to Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, the Lord desires to gather us up as a mother hen gathers up her chicks and carries them under her feathers, under her wings, within her wings, to protect them, to carry them to safety, and to nurture them. He even desires to do this for his enemies if they will receive him by faith. Those who neither walk by faith nor desire to do so will reject the teachings of our Lord. If you don't want him, you will not have him. By your own doing, by your own will, you will not have him. But if your rejection and lack of faith is there, if it's evident, if that's what you want, in spite of your lack of faith and your lack of trust, despite the fact that you will not allow the Lord to nurture you, despite the fact you will not receive the word that is for you, for your life, even if you do not receive it, it does not make Jesus any less the Savior. Then Abraham's doubt made God any less God. The God who revealed himself to Abram in a vision with a definitive word of commitment in the present and a future good hope is the same God who was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. And this is the same God who according to his word will come again and receive you unto himself if you believe, if you believe. If you believe that God is God, why wonder at his power? Why wonder at his promises? Why stumble? Yet God is still calling you, even in your doubt, even in your disbelief, even in your stumbling, even in your wavering, God is still calling you. You're yet alive. God is still calling you to receive him at his word. God is still doing things to build your faith. God is still doing things to bless your life and to say to you, even though you're having trouble receiving me and believing me, I want you to know I'm still God. But remember, nurturing faith is a dual work of both God and you. God will remind you of his promises to you and will perform works that demonstrate his faithfulness to you. But you must take God at his word by faith just because it is God who has spoken it. Not by proof, but by faith. Just because God is the one who said it. Though you find yourself in doubt, God is still nurturing your faith. Let God bless you today. Let God bless you today and let God bless you into eternity. Repent and believe. I pray you will. Amen.
whether in person or by social media. Thank you for joining us today for this March 13, 2022 media cast of the Heinz Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. We continue to keep you in prayer and pray that this service has been a blessing to you and that the Lord will use it to draw you closer to him and to help you through the week. If you receive the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior today, we rejoice with you in thanking God that you have chosen to put your trust in Christ and invite you to join us as a member of the family of Heinz Memorial. We also pray that you will continue to receive these services as a means to your discipleship and spiritual growth. Please write to us or email us at heinzmemorial at gmail.com to let us know how the Lord is blessing you. Thank you for your prayers, presence, participation, and support. Contributions may be mailed in, picked up, or given electronically by downloading the Givelify app and searching for the Heinz Memorial CME Church in Albany, Georgia. Follow the steps in the app to make your contribution. You may also mail your contributions to us at Heinz Memorial CME Church, 408 North Madison Street, Albany, Georgia, 31701. Please continue to be safe, wearing your mask, sanitizing your hands, maintaining social distance according to CDC guidelines, and if you have not, strongly consider receiving a COVID-19 vaccination and booster. Here are some additional announcements and observations. Daily scripture readings are provided through the online ministry of Vanderbilt University Library. Thank you to all those who participated in today's service as you allowed God to use you to his glory. From the Commission on Human Justice, from the Commission on Social Justice and Human Concerns, the month of March is Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. The Bible teaches that every person conceived in this world is a unique creation of God. That includes the disabled and handicapped. Developmental disabilities impact all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. According to the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, ADHD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, Cerebral Palsy, Hearing Loss, Intellectual Disability, Learning Disability, and Vision Impairment are just some of the disabilities. Resources are available for individuals with, de with developmental disabilities. Please visit the CDC. The following are a few scriptures that address disabilities. Exodus chapter 4 verse 11, John chapter 9 verses 1 through 3, and Isaiah chapter 43 verse 8. Today's service is available via Pastor Spragan's YouTube channel. You may also listen via phone at 10.45 a.m. Eastern Time by dialing 1-978-990-5000 and using access code 151404. Please continue to minister to our sick, shut-in, and others with your loving prayers and other acts of support. These include Sister Ella Miller, Sister Mary Williams, Sister Geneva Hill, Sister Juanita Miller, Sister Janet Edwards, Brother Michael Sanderson, Sister Julia Williams Harris, Brother Charles Harris, Brother Marquavius Mason, Brother Prince Brooks, Brother Keith Lemon, Sister Henretta Benson, Sister Judith Namasaka and family, Brother Julius Pegues, and Sister Janine Richard. Our schedule of activities for this week include the following. On Monday, March 14, the Albany Thomasville District will have a book review and the Zoom ID and the passcode have been given out. We also wish a happy birthday to Chauncey Shaw on Monday, March 14. On Wednesday, March 16, we'll have group Bible study at 12 noon Eastern Time. You're invited to join us by dialing one 978 990-5000, access code 151404. 
Our scriptures are Psalm 105, verses 1 through 42, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 22, and Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 31. That's Psalm 105, verses 1 through 42, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 22, and Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 31. On Friday, March 18, we wish a happy birthday to Valerie Holton and Rhea Brian James. And finally, on Saturday, March 19, the South Georgia Region Quarterly Reading Review will be held, and the Zoom information has been given. And we also wish on March 19 a happy birthday to Talisa Roberts. Thank you for joining us in worship today. It is our prayer that you will enjoy your day and that you will join us again next Sunday at 1045 a.m. Eastern Time. Until then, continue in the worship and praise of God. And we pray that God will keep you in his perfect peace. In Jesus' name, amen.